So esters are what happens when organic acids have children with alcohols. The two kind of come together and they make a third molecular child. Thiols are a little bit different because they contain sulfur and the thiol group is actually kind of central to plant metabolism. All plants will reduce sulfate into a thiol group, which is the constituent of cysteine. And then once it's there, it starts to be branched off into other things. So pretty much everywhere we find sulfur as, as being uh, electrochemically useful, um, we see it in the form of a thiol group. The biggest one is glutathione. Uh, you guys heard of glutathione? It's even a health supplement for humans. You can buy glutathione, you can take it, and it's supposed to deal with you know, stress and provide antioxidant support. Well, what ends up happening in plants is that glutathione has a thiol group that is capable of being reduced and oxidized. So it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth, millions of times uh, over the course of, you know, a normal day. Um, plants balance out their oxidative stress levels using thiol groups. So if there's too much stress going on inside of the plant, the thiol groups can quench that. They become oxidized. And then once the plants build up their reduction power again, they can reduce the glutathione again. So the glutathione status of a plant is really a marker for health. Um, but as far as like measuring carbon in terms of in the plants and the biomass, really you'd be looking for carbon containing molecules. If I was growing strawberries, I would be looking at bricks. If I was growing wine grapes, I'd probably be looking at fermentable sugars. I may also be interested in anthocyanins and phenolic compounds if I'm making a red wine, for example, and I want that color to come through. Um, so we wouldn't be looking at specifically like what is the carbon content. We would be looking at specifically like what is the phenolic profile, right? What's the antioxidant? They have ORAC ratings, ORAC ratings, um, which pull in all these carbon-containing molecules. And they don't specify exactly like what is the percent composition by carbon, but we just kind of lump it all together. Um, we call it essential oils when we're doing steam distillation of um, herbs and things like that. Or even when we're brewing beer uh, and using hops, they're looking for um, volatile um, I'm sorry, they're looking for mostly carbon-based molecules. Um, the, the hops thing is also really interesting too because there's a couple of volatile sulfur compounds like there's, they're called mercaptans, um, M-E-R-C-A-P-T-A-N-S. And these are the ones that give tropical fruits like lychee and passion fruit and mango. They're intense tropical fruity vibes, but those are also sulfur-containing compounds. They're not produced in very high concentrations, but the, the, the point is that at a very low concentration, this intensely tropical fruity, um, you know, flavor profile can mesh in really well with some of the more uh, higher concentration like limonene and pinene and myrcene, which may not be as strong, but they're present in a higher concentration. So the interaction between the two of them is what gives that full complex turf profile. It's fascinating, man. When you think about that, it's, it's so many years. I'm actually working on a video right now on my channel. And it's, it's talking more about how for years I was thinking that the flavors are because terpenes and flavonoids alone. And then I'm learning more about thiols and I'm understanding more again about esters and these other things where I'm like, oh, these are these expressions. Why? It's not just this. It's this, this, and this. And the, the chemical reaction between everything. And it, it, it's got me thinking now with, with carbon, just people who have organic-based soils, how would a product like, like Rooted Leaf, for example, how would that work within the soil food web? Like would there be better microbes to work along with the carbon or would it be something that whatever you already have, it'll kind of symbiotic relationship will work together? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our products work great with living soils. Um, we use about three dozen species of plants and we're extracting them whole. Like we bring in the whole plants and, you know, we'll grind them down and then we'll extract them. So basically at the end of, you know, inside of each product that we make, there's about a dozen species of plants. And even in the healthiest living soils, you're not going to find that level of biological, I should say biochemical activity going on. We do put specific food sources. We put substrates in for beneficial microbes and fungi so that if you've got your own native soil biology, um, feeding our products can help feed those microbes and sustain those populations. It's really just about creating a living soil. So you can start with something like ProMix, just an inert peat and perlite and use our products uh, by the end of that first round, you'll have the equivalent of a living soil that's structured well. It may not be very nutrient rich because our products are very uh, rapidly available for plants. But I'm also inspired by the Amazon rainforest because if you take a soil sample from the Amazon, you realize there's not much nutrition that's in the soil. And the reason is because the nutrition is tied up in the plants. You've got massive, massive amounts of canopy. You've got all these plants that are actually living. You don't have the slow release stuff built up in the soil. It's not meant to take forever to break down. The top 12 inches just re constantly every day, just churning over those minerals. And, you know, they fall back down as the decay and the litter and the corpses of all the insects, etc. cetera, uh, hang out on the floor. And then very rapidly that's taken back up and lifted up into the canopy. 
of the Amazon. So like my goal with our products is to make sure that things can be fully alive rather than locking something up in a box in the soil and, and having the plants work hard to break it down and access it. Um, having said that though, for people that do run amendments and like to use something like gypsum or bone meals for slow release forms, doing foliar, doing foliar sprays of our products works really well. It lets the plants absorb the organic acids, um, which are carbon based and then use them to create um, root exudates. These root exudates can be modified depending on what plants need. So like when we look at plants that are in iron or phosphorus um, starvation mode, like they know they're really low on iron or phosphorus. One of the things that we see plants do is they produce a lot of citric acid. And the reason that citric acid is what's called a phytosiderophore or a chelating agent is the fancy word for chelating agent um, that's produced and, and it's secreted from the roots. So it grabs onto the iron, it makes it soluble, and then the plants can pull it back in. And then in the case of phosphorus, it actually just dislodges the phosphate. So the phosphorus will be bound up in something like some rock phosphate form or mineral phosphate form that may have low solubility. And the acids that plants are producing is supposed to kind of like melt that bond a little bit and grab the thing that the phosphate is attached to. And then once the phosphate is free, the, the plants can take it up. Um, so this is a, a strategy we see in, in biology. Um, so doing foliar sprays of our products definitely helps um, get the soil chemistry dialed in the exact way that the plants need it to be dialed in. Um, oftentimes you put something in the soil, but maybe your plants want something different. So it's really just about giving them the tools to access whatever they want when they want it, as opposed to forcing them to eat the stuff that's in their immediate vicinity. Genius. Genius. I, my question is, I'm curious, as we've kind of discussed, and as many of us know, terpenes are not exclusive to our plant. Uh, they're all over the environment. Uh, real quick, how many terpenes are there? There's been over 70,000 characterized terpenes so far. Um, Individu think, individual, yeah, yeah, yeah 70,000? Shit, I didn't think it was that many. That's wild. Um, yeah. so, so my question is, do you think, based on how little we know on the impact, or maybe not as little we know, but how much we've used carbon to impact our ability to exploit this plant, do you think that we have seen it all in regards to the terpene production? Or do you think we've kind of just scratched the surface in regards to what our plant has to offer in terms of terpene expression? I think we've just scratched the surface. I mean, these yes. plants are so remarkably complex and they're so expressive too. I mean, you can have, um, that's why I think you, you know, people are focused so much on chemovars and chemotypes. Because even if you take cuts off the same mom, the environment that they're grown in can be radically different. It can have an effect on the expressions overall. So my thing is that I think that there's stuff buried in the in the DNA of, of certain species of plants that gets muted over time. That if you continue to feed inadequate fertilizers and if you continue to set up poor environments where the plants are constantly stressed, you'll get this down regulation of this like magic sauce that the plant is trying to produce. And it could just be a tomato that has this like crazy flavor profile. You've never tried it in any other tomato before. Everybody's sick and tired of the watery tomatoes at the store. You know, you bite into them and it's just, it kind of tastes like the nitrates that they used to grow it, you know? And um, so plants are in the business of expressing themselves based on what their environment allows for. When you put a chemical environment into the plant that draws a ton of reduction power away, like 25% of all of the money that the plant makes is basically taxed to create nitrates. And that's not, it's not really interesting for the plants to reduce the nitrate into an amino acid. I mean, it's important, don't get me wrong, particularly for protein production. For plants like corn, it becomes very important because the nitrogen gets stored in the kernel. And then humans who eat that corn depend on it for being a, a good protein source. We want it to be healthy for us. Um, so in that case, it is important. But by and large, we, we just really want to get our plants to focus more on producing these carbon-rich metabolites. And really what that means is finding ways to get out of the way. You know, stop putting stuff in that, that slows the plants down or, or drags them down with unnecessary inputs and kind of sets the stage to allow them to express whatever they want to express. And I, I do think people that, you know, growers that get smart about how incorporate how to incorporate carbon into their feed program um, are more likely to get these kind of vastly different expressions overall. I mean, I've seen some strains produce like humulene and uh, like I, I we had one strain, it was a pineapple upside down cake that produced three and a half percent eucalyptol. And eucalyptol is typically not found in, in anything except for eucalyptus. So to have, you know, some other flowers that were grown that, that smelled like straight up eucalyptus, it was very cooling, very minty. Um, it's very, very unusual, but um, these are not the types of things that I think most of the consumers are looking for quite yet. 
but it's certainly true that as the industry involves, so too will the demands that consumers have. And I definitely see something coming up in the next you know, in the next phase of the the uh, industry across the nation, where I do think you'll start to have people demanding these ultra rare, ultra exotic things like a eucalyptol dominant flower, um, which is wild. And, you know, if you've never tried it, it's worth seeking out for sure. This FTS clip was brought to you by AC Infinity, leaders in garden innovation. Use discount code the stash 15 at checkout to save some money on your order. From the stash podcast.